un encuentro Thank científico. For being a continuación, present. recibimos Now, a Rob Knight, Rob investigador Knight, y director fundador del Centro de Innovación de Microbiomas de la Tierra. Las investigaciones en su laboratorio implican los microbiomas de humanos, animales y medio ambiente, gracias a lo cual ha potenciado la ciencia del microbioma de alto rendimiento. Además, su trabajo ha permitido relacionar microbios con variadas condiciones de salud, mejorando la comprensión de los distintos tipos de gérmenes. Buenas tardes. Es un placer estar invitado de vuelta acá. Y me encantó el tema para el Congreso Futuro de este año que se llama Ideas para el Nuevo Mundo. Quería contarles ese, lo que estamos descubriendo ahora, especialmente en cuanto a la bacteria que está en el intestino. Y esto está en pleno descubrimiento ahora, en el mapeo de lo conocido y averiguar sobre todas las cosas que están dentro de nuestro cuerpo. Uh, mapping these bacteria isn't just for fun. Esta bacteria We're discovering that they do a tremendous estamos amount of averiguando que hacen muchas cosas para nosotros. So for example, para just uh, over the past five so to ten years, uh, bacteria in the gut have been linked to a wide number of disease, diseases, ranging from depression and anxiety. Uh, as uh, uh, as uh, uh, Professor Cran told you about just a few minutes ago, but also many others. And so for example, we used to think that uh, stomach ulcers were caused by stress. Um, uh, now we know that it was bacteria that caused them, and this discovery won the Nobel Prize. Uh, we also know that bacteria can do good things, such as protecting against asthma. And although my colleague uh, Jack Gilbert at uh, UC San Diego uh, um, has not yet won the Nobel Prize for this, uh, perhaps it's just a matter of time. So, So bacteria are doing all these different things in our body, and when I tell you uh, that I do microbiology, you probably have an image like this of an old man with a beard peering down a microscope. But that is not what it's like at all today. Uh, it is very technology-driven, and it is largely driven by, uh, by students and by uh, technicians doing everything from using technology to scan the tens of thousands of samples we receive each year, uh, to using uh, robots to extract from them the DNA, uh, and then to make libraries that we can Uh, sequence the DNA sequence from uh, using, uh, using modern sequencing platforms. And so we get a tremendous number of DNA sequences that we use to read out the bacteria rather than looking under a microscope. However, we have a big data problem, and that problem is due to the fact that in your gut, each teaspoon of your stool contains the amount of data it would take one ton of DVDs to store. And so to get a handle on all of this information about the microbes in our body, to discover this microbial side of ourselves, increasingly we are turning uh, to uh, artificial intelligence and uh, using, using advanced algorithms to understand all of that data. And uh, just a couple of years ago, uh, we launched a partnership between IBM and UC San Diego, uh, the Center for Artificial Intelligence and Healthy Living that I co-direct with Professor de la Geste. And uh, this is part, um, uh, and, uh, Uh, this, this, uh, and uh, this, this is part of the uh, IBM AI Horizons Network, so we're connected to many others uh, doing AI research. So uh, some patterns in the microbiome we don't need AI for. Some of them are so obvious we can decipher them even without puny human brains. And to give you an example, uh, the pattern of the microbiome development in early life is not subtle. You can easily see the curve on that graph, where for people in three different countries, essentially 95% of their gut microbiome development is over by two and a half years of life as they approach the, the adult state. So we can see these very obvious patterns without using advanced algorithms. And you might wonder, well, what does this mean if most of our microbiome development happens in the first two and a half years? Does it mean that by the time we're three years old, our microbiome is doomed if our parents didn't do the right things for us? Well, to find out the answer to that, uh, we launched the American Gut Project which is a citizen science project that allows anyone uh, to send in a sample and support the cost using crowdfunding and crowdsourcing of adding themselves to this ongoing project. And so we have an extensive questionnaire and samples from many different countries, and now over 25,000 samples. So you can find a microbiome twin somewhere in the world who doesn't share your genetic material from your host genome, but maybe shares your microbiome. 
Sorry, I guess we're having some technical Estamos trouble with the clicker. So técnicos. uh many many people assume that it was just a fully automated pipeline, but now you know better and you've seen some of the procedures that separate the stool sample uh, to the technical procedure that lets us read out the DNA from the samples. Y se saca el ADN de las muestras. Um, and this, uh, this allows us to collect a huge amount of information Esto about what affects your gut microbiome. And so uh, this graph is a little technical, but essentially the steeper the curve means that we need fewer people to see a particular kind of an effect. So things like your age, whether you have diseases like inflammatory bowel disease, whether you've used antibiotics, how fat you are, how much you drink, and so on, all impact your microbiome. But one of the largest effects that we saw very early in the project was that the effect of how many different kinds of plants you eat has a very very large effect on your microbiome, in some cohorts even larger than age, and so this led us to wonder whether our diet could have such a large effect on the microbiome that you could even reverse aging. Now, um, unlike the change with the microbiome and age in small children I showed you, the changes with age with the microbiome in adults are very subtle, and so uh, these are the complicated these are the complicated Entonces, patterns that we get when we run a technique called random forest regression. And uh, essentially these patterns are not, interpretable, uh, uh, are, not, uh, are not interpretable with our own brains, um, but rather we need to turn to uh, artificial intelligence algorithms uh, to be able to decipher and uh, measure the statistical significance of these patterns that exist in the data. Um, and so uh, and, and so uh, Entonces, the random forest regression model even allows us to tell how old you are decir, from a sample of your eh, microbiome. Tan, tan so, uh, 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 so I want you to guess um, to what, uh, to what, uh, how, how well we can predict your age from a stool sample. The amazing truth is that from a sample of your stool, we can predict your age uh, to, within, um, to within 12 years. Um, but what's even more remarkable is we turn to microbes in other parts of the body. So uh, from the microbes in your mouth, uh, from the microbes in your mouth, uh, we can predict your age to within five years. And then perhaps most remarkably, from the microbes in your skin, uh, we can predict your age to within four years. And so all of these microbes all over your body are providing a remarkably accurate readout of your age. So, um, this is, so that's what happens on average, but then you might wonder, how does your microbiome age compare to normal? And the motivation for this is that most people age in a particular way uh, where the microbiome changes in a clock-like manner. But suppose you have a microbiome that's very young, even though your chronological age is old, then you might expect to be healthier than the other people of the same chronological age. And then correspondingly, uh, maybe your microbiome age less happily uh, is old at a time when your chronological age is young. Uh, maybe that means that you have accelerated aging. And in animal experiments, when you take the microbiome from an old animal and transplant it into, into a young animal, that young animal will age faster. Correspondingly, if you take the microbes from a young animal and put them in an, uh, into an old animal, you can make it healthier and extend its lifespan. So, uh, so, so uh, over the past few years, uh, we and many other collaborators, uh, not just UC San Diego, have been studying a particularly healthy aging population in the Italian village of Cilento. And this is just to give you an idea of the scope of the organizations involved in this project. But uh, one thing that often captures people's imagination is the food in Chilento, where even at age 100, uh, these individuals are still remarkably healthy and are going out to gather herbs from the wild to use in their cooking. So naturally that leads you to wonder if there's something special about the plants that they eat. And one thing that many people have latched onto is rosemary. Um, unfortunately, we didn't get to go to, uh, to Italy to collect the rosemary to try this out. So in this pilot, my colleague Peter Durrestein uh, used the rosemary that grows between his lab and mine. And what we could do is we could scan it and dice it up into little pieces and then use a technique uh, called liquid chromatography and molecular cartography uh, to, uh, to scan the whole plant and then look 3D and where all of the different kinds of molecules are, not just what I'm showing you, but over 10,000 molecules. And uh, when we do this, uh, what we can see is uh, the bioactive molecules like rosemarinic acid, methoxycarnosic acid and so on are very non-randomly distributed around the plant. So rosemarinic acid is mostly on the old leaves, methoxycarnosic acid is mostly on the new leaves. 
And we also see a huge number of unidentified metabolites, unique to the flowers or the stems or to the foliage, but again, some of them are on the young leaves, some are on the old leaves, some are distributed throughout the plant. So what we are trying to figure out now is the ethnobotany of how these plants are used to understand whether people have learned uh, through cultural traditions to expose themselves to the right, uh, kinds, uh, the, the right kinds of molecules. Now, uh, this ties into the broad tradition um, that, that you should be eating the rainbow, and the language of color, uh, the language of food is very much expressed in color, where everything from uh, the red and the tomatoes to the orange and the carrots uh, is a particular molecule that we're now starting to learn may have an impact on the gut microbiome. However, it's not always easy to get access to this uh, wide variety of fresh fruits and vegetables. Regrettably, this is the source of food closest to my house in California, and when I take my eight-year-old there, she is exposed to many bright colors, but you might argue that they have systematically stripped out uh, all, of the, all, of, all of the healthy compounds and replaced them with artificial analogs that have completely different physiological effects. And there is precedent for this. Uh, so this plant that you might think of as a healthy component of diet killed hundreds of thousands of people in the United States in the early part of the 20th century. But this mass murderer had an accomplice, uh, an industrial process called the bio degeminator that you could use to make cornmeal shelf-stable for months instead of having it go rancid in three days. But the problem was that the advanced process stripped out the niacin, leading to an epidemic of pellagra. And what was most tragic about this is that the mechanism was worked out as far ago, as 1913, but it took another 30 years before anything was done to bring this compound back into the food supply and cure uh, hundreds of thousands of people who were being sickened by it. Now, the concept that you can strengthen yourself uh, with a shield made of food, not just against chronic disease, but also against infectious disease, which is one of the side effects of pellagra and rickets and many other nutritional disorders, uh, again, is not new. And the idea, the, uh, the idea that a healthy diet could act as a shield is a very sound concept. But working out the details of what you make that shield out of turns out to be challenging. For example, uh, you cannot make that shield out of iron if you are trying to guard against pathogens like salmonella. And in fact, iron supplementation programs have had unintended consequences of releasing bacteria that can cause harm that have been limited by iron. And so instead, if you're trying to target something like salmonella, what you have to do is instead instead build that shield out of copper and vitamin C and arginine. But uh, the studies to do this were painstaking and individual and took a long time, many years for each of those compounds, just for that one pathogen. So, um, so the problem with this type of research at the moment is that it is heroic effort, where everyone must be an explorer uh, like Magellan and undertake a very dangerous and very lengthy voyage and only see a tiny part of the world even doing all of that. And what we need to do is develop the equivalent instead of a GPS satellite where we see the whole world at once and can navigate directly from where we are at the moment uh, to exactly where we, want to, uh, where we want to go at the level of individual addresses. And so to make progress towards this in nutrition, um, Peter Darastan and I launched the Global Foodomics Project a few years ago where we are running thousands of samples of food through the mass spec to understand what's truly in them and looking at their biotransformations. So the idea is to take the data from this Global Foodomics Project to see what goes into our bodies cross-reference it with the American gut fecal data to see what comes out, and then combine the analysis of them. And uh, this is early data from Julia Gaglitz, uh, who's uh, doing uh, his, his, uh, the technical lead on the project. And each of these dots is a molecule, and if it's green, it came from food, if it's brown, it came out the other end, and if it's blue, it was found in both locations. And you see there is not a lot of blue on that map, and that speaks to the profound transformation that our food undergoes as it passes through our digestive tracts. So um, recently uh, we have been extending this to look not just at the plants but inside animals. And so this is a 3D MRI scan of a mouse that we then dissected and ran each piece through the DNA sequencer and each piece through the mass spec to see all the microbes and all of the molecules throughout the mouse where we can highlight thousands of different features. And what this allows us to do for the first time is to see where in the body each of these transformations happens by comparing germ-free to normal mice where what we can see is, for example, uh, molecules like soya saponin, a component of diet from soy, accumulate in the germ-free mice, but you never see it in the normal mice. Whereas uh, its breakdown product, soya saponinol, accumulates in the normal mice. And the reason why is that only bacteria can do the reaction that turns that uh, item that you eat in your diet 
into its chemical product. And we're doing this now for thousands of other reactions. Um, and it's not just us. So uh, my colleague Carsten Ziegler at UC San Diego uh, recently discovered uh, that uh, the bacterial enzymes are what make the, make the difference between whether red meat is good for you or bad for you in terms of inflammation, where some people have bacteria that are able to deactivate a kind of sugar on the surface of the red meat. And so the microbiome is increasingly explaining personalization, where one man's meat is another man's poison. Quite literally, you may be able to change what foods are healthy for you by changing your microbiome. Now, um, uh, now the personalization uh, is a bit of an issue for public health, uh, public health initiatives, and there are some foods that we already know are definitely bad for us, and there is precedent um, for, uh, for, 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 for labeling and taking these foods off the market in terms of cigarettes. So, for example, Australia has introduced a series of more and more graphic warnings over time, so that if you buy a pack of cigarettes in Australia, you get these very graphic uh, images of its impact on your body. Um, Chile has already made progress on this and is a world leader in terms of doing this kind of thing for food. And uh, already, uh, as, as, uh, as I'm sure you know, cartoon characters have been withdrawn from the, uh, from the labels of many foods that are bad for us. And uh, our host and organizer of this Chilean Futures uh, Congress has worked with the WHO and with the Chilean government uh, to do exactly this, uh, to label unhealthy food as unhealthy. And uh, this was a remarkably uh, important first step, and I'm sure all of you are familiar with these labels about high in sugar, high in fat, high in sodium, high in calories. But uh, just as in Australia, the progress on cigarette labeling was from relatively benign labels to extremely graphic ones, maybe we need to go further as we find out what the impacts these, la uh, these items have on our health, and not just label what's in the food, but what it will do for our bodies. So, for example, you might need a label that tells you directly that if you eat this food, you will age rapidly and die young, not just about the ingredients that's in it. So, uh, it, it is not just our bodies no that we need to be concerned cuerpo, about. So, uh, this, this graph uh, I adapted from a paper from uh, David Tillman's lab that came out in PNAS recently. And uh, what is amazing is that for each of these many types of food, he was able to score them uh, how terms, uh, in terms of how bad they are for you and how bad they are for the planet. And what is astonishing is a strong positive correlation where, in general, the foods that will harm your health will also harm the planet in terms of water use, fertilizer use, global warming, and so on whereas those that are good for us are good for the planet as well. So the new idea that I hope to leave you with is that perhaps uh, what we need is a new kind of food for health that is going to affect the health of our bodies, but also, the, uh, also affect the health of our planet and solve both of those problems simultaneously. Thank you.